Wow, man. Right there. You hear that clip right there. That's from Making a Murderer, uh, which is a series that um, we've seen the first season of that series. Now we're talking about Making a Murderer Part 2, Heather B. I know you're really into this one, you know, uh, this investigator-style type show that's on Netflix. Uh, I remember in the first one, this is an Emmy Award-winning show, and it, it followed the uh, journey of Stephen Avery from DNA exoneree and reformer to convicted murderer. Uh, now we have our two guests today, Laura Ricciardi, who's here with us today. Give her a big round of applause. Woo! Damn it, damn it. And Mora <laughs> Demas. Demas. That's, That's right. That's I, right. I, there we go. Welcome, Galloway. <laughs> uh, how are you guys doing? We're Let's start with you, Laura. Be- <laughs> you, <laughs> you sound like it. No, good. <laughs> Well, we live in L.A. now, but we're okay. really thrilled to be here in New York promoting the show and trying to encourage viewers to tune in again. Did you expect the first season to do so well? What do you think made it appeal so much to our, our society? I mean, we certainly didn't expect the level of response, but, you know, I think it comes down to the themes and the characters. You uh-huh. know, it's a story about identity. You know, a man who right in the beginning says, I don't want to be a criminal. I want to be normal. Mm-hmm. And he's got people telling him otherwise his whole life. Mm, I didn't look at it like that, but mm-hmm. I guess that's interesting. So he was a victim of his environment, and his right, or is that what you're saying? Or he was influenced by his environment, or? Well, I mean, that's certainly one of the questions we raise. You know, we mm-hmm. had we chose his story to tell. You know, he was a man who had been failed by the system in 1985 and mm-hmm. spent 18 years in prison, and now 20 years later was stepping back into the system. And you know, people were talking like, now we have DNA. We mm-hmm. have legislative reforms. Like this won't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. So it was an opportunity to sort of hold a mirror up and to ask people to look at themselves. To look at themselves. So part two, um, how is it different from season season two? How is it different from season one? Laura, are you going to jump in this anytime? I'll, I'll okay, jump okay. in right <laughs> okay. now. <laughs> so part two, um, we go on a journey with both Stephen and Brendan's advocates um, mm-hmm. through the post-conviction phase of this process. We thought it would be a new chapter in the same story but would offer something new to viewers. I mean, this is definitely a lesser known part of the system. We have two people at the center of the story who've been convicted, who are serving life sentences. Stephen is not eligible for parole. Mm -hmm. Brendan is eligible for parole when he'll be 59 years old in 2048. Mm -hmm. So we knew at the end of part one that, um, you know, they were maintaining their innocence, that they vowed to fight, to free themselves, to clear their names. And, um, you know, we thought that going on a journey with their advocates would really give us a window into this part of the system and also help us to better understand the emotional toll it takes on, you know, all who are involved. Mm -hmm. That's what I got from it, because I think Brenda's father uh, is in it. He's talking. Pete, is this Peter? Peter Dassey. Yeah, Peter Dassey. And I'm a father and I'm sitting here watching this man talk about his son and his crime he was convicted of committing and saying, man, he would never her to fly, you know, and then, but you realize looking in his face that he's in prison as well as his son, right? It's true. I mean, you know, it's not just about, you know, the men that are in prison or it's not just about, you know, the woman that was murdered. You know, all of these people have families and it's, you know, everybody's a victim here. Mm -hmm. You know, we often talk, you know, there's no winners in this story. It's pain all around. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, man, you guys are scaring me. <laughs> it's pain all around. What I want to do, I'm open up the phone lines, and, and and this is such an interesting series, and it's real. It's real life. This is not fiction. Making a murderer part two. Perhaps you had some experience with DNA evidence. Maybe you were exonerated or convicted. I don't know because of it. Um, a eight um eight 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 seven four two three three four five. Give us a call. Sway in the morning, shade four five. Right, we got Laura and Marta are here. Am I saying it right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, making a murder report too, and we, we're talking about the story of St- uh, Stephen Avery, um, who was a, a DNA exoneree and a reformer to convicted murderer. Um, and his story in the first season really, you know, it, it g- 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 gathered a lot of attention. You know, he was wrongfully convicted of a crime. Um, it, years later, it came out, and he wanted to fight against that and sue those who uh, convicted him of that crime. During that time, he was going for thirty-six million dollars, HP, thirty-six million dollars. And during that crime, on time, he was charged for another crime, 
uh, which the police said there was physical evidence to, and he was convicted of that crime, right? Uh, That's correct. And so he had to settle in the first crime in order to pay his bills, his attorney bills, but people feel, a lot of people, him and a lot of people who are his advocates, feel that it was foul play by the police <laughs> department. This season... You guys are exploring the effects of all of this, right? With uh, with the people that surround him. That's right. This this season, we're we're with Stephen and Brendan's advocates, mm-hmm. and you know we're in the post conviction phase. So by definition, what you're doing is looking back at what happened. So um, Stephen's attorney is this woman, Kathleen Zellner, who's actually the winningest private post conviction attorney in the United States. At the mm-hmm. time we met her, she had helped um, free seventeen people from wrongful convictions during the time we've been filming with her she's won freedom for two other people Mm. so you know she is very effective and what's exciting about her is that you know she does things differently so Mm -hmm. to see somebody succeeding by doing things differently is incredibly exciting you know she doesn't work from behind the desk she goes to the crime scene she gets her hands on evidence and you know, we think it's an exciting opportunity for viewers because we we understand that we left viewers with unresolved questions. Yeah, we had a lot of questions. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's not our job, Laura and my job, to answer those. But now we have a character who's herself trying to answer questions. So, uh-huh. you know, it's a really exciting journey to go on with her. Wow, this is really interesting. And then Brandon, it's just, is he, why is he, why was he charged in this um. Well, Brendan was um, first indif- interviewed by the police several times and later interrogated by him. And um, the result of that interrogation, they, they took a confession from him. So he said that, you know, Stephen Avery was involved in the crime and that he was involved in the crime. But the question his attorneys are, um, you know, seeking to answer in part two is is will the courts... Um, recognize that his that he did not give his confession of his own free will mm-hmm. that he was coerced mm-hmm. that these interrogators investigators were seasoned officers Brendan Dassey at the time was 16 years old um, he, there was not a present a lawyer a guardian present mm-hmm. while he was being talked to by the police um, it's questionable whether he even knew what was going on or what the role of the police was so, you know, what Brenda's attorneys are now asking the federal courts to do is to look back at what happened in the state court system and to rule on whether or not um, Brendan gave this confession of his own free will. And if not, to overturn his conviction. And then it would be up to the state whether to release him from prison yeah. or to retry him. Okay. Wow. Okay, DB? Yeah, uh, I just want to make a slight pivot for a second because yesterday it was a big story about um, Jason Blum, the head of Blumhouse uh, Productions, and he said that they were looking f- to hire more female directors in the horror genre, but said that somehow like he couldn't find any. And so there were a lot of female directors coming on social media saying, like, maybe you're not looking far enough. I mean, give somebody a chance and then you'll find some. And so with regards to what you guys are doing, you guys have won Emmys. You wrote, direct, produced this whole thing. You helmed this whole project. And even though it's it's based on it's more of a documentary style, you guys are still representing for women directors and writers and people who are behind the camera. So how important was that aspect of doing this? Well, I think that's a great question. You know, when we first read about Stephen Avery, when he made the front page of the New York Times, we were both in our 30s. We were finishing up graduate film school, and, you know, we knew nobody was going to be swinging any doors open for us. Nobody was going to be asking us, you know, what film do you want to make? So, you know, a lot of the decisions behind taking that leap and going to Wisconsin, moving there for 18 months and starting this project was, you know, creating our own opportunity um, and just proving what we could do, you know, having faith in ourselves. Mm. Yeah, and I w- just to add to what Moira was saying, I mean, you know, we would like our experience to serve as an example or an inspiration to emerging artists. Um, we think it's important for a range of voices to be represented in the arts and elsewhere in society, of course. Um, but there is another side to it. I mean, people who are in positions of power, uh, people who are working in the studios or working at outlets like Netflix, it's important that they recognize their own responsibility to hire, you know, people, um, you know, across the spectrum and to give people a chance. And and not only that, but you know, s- support artists, support emerging artists, encourage them. And I, I do see some of that happening. And I think I think there needs to be a lot more of it, though. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, uh, making a murderer part two premiering tomorrow on Netflix. Uh, Laura and, and Maura is here, are here. I said it right, Maura. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're getting better and better. Uh, let me hear you say it. Let me hear you say it. <laughs> Moira. Moira. Ah, Moira. Oh my gosh, I've been destroying your name the whole time. You was putting like a Spanish I accent on it. I'm trying to roll the R's all kind of stuff. Moira. Oh my gosh. All right. Oh, let me take one quick call. Carlos from North Carolina. Good morning, Carlos. Hey, Sway. How you doing, man? Doing great, uh, man. Yeah, I have. I, I'm not familiar with this uh, story, but just off of what you guys were talking about, I experienced it from the inside. I was, I did 17 years, and uh, a lot of people are missing. You know, they feel like once a person is convicted, oh, he must have done it, but they don't realize the what goes on behind the scenes with the prosecutors. And prosecutors are only concerned with their conviction rates. Mm. Like prosecutors, like they they like to boast their numbers. So mm. anything, whenever they get a case. Their, their job is to prosecute. They don't care if you're innocent or guilty. Hmm. They're going in on the prosecution. If It's on you to prove that you didn't do it. But prosecutors are good. They hold a lot of sway in the court system. And they, they you know, basically they, they are the boss of the police department. So they tell police what they need for a conviction. And police go get it. That's where the corruption comes in. You what, know, so, you know, I was... What happened in your you case? Uh, I I had 30 years, actually. I was sentenced to 30 years for selling drugs, but I, I won my appeal post-conviction, and I got got it reduced to 20 years, and in the feds, you do 85%, so I did 17 on the 20. Mm. You know, but, yeah, I, initially I had 300. My outdate was 2028. No, 26. 2026, but I was fortunate enough to win my post-conviction, which is hard. It's hard to win, you know, because... Uh, they don't want to overturn these these prosecutors' sentences because it goes against their numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, so it's it's a it's a lot that you got to look at. It's the prosecution, man. And, and it's, that it's, it's, and, it's, a, it's a funny game. And similar to Carlos, that's kind of what you're suggesting. Brendan may have went through right in terms of the interrogation and how people are trapped into cop and pleas. You know, the other thing, Carlos, too, is you could try a case uh, and decide not to settle. You would you probably could have got more years, correct? No, nah, I went to trial. Oh, so you went you, to trial. You go to, yeah, and that's why I got 30. They offer, they give you an offer. I didn't want to know what my offer was. So the feds, they, like, they, they are real funny about their convictions, man. And if you don't cop, if you don't cop a plea and you go to trial, they're going to make you pay. Hmm. They're going to make you pay. So that's, it's, that's what it's basically. They, they got to make an example out of you so other people will not go to trial. And that go a, a plea, if you plead guilty, that goes as a conviction. Hmm. Carlos, thank you, man. You're a citizen. It's way in the morning. You know what I'm wondering, ladies? Um, in your research, do you find that it is easier for women who are accused of murder to kind of get out just because, you know, the, the narrative throughout society has been that women are innocent and we're demure and we would never be able to um, carry out such violent actions? I mean, I think that's a great question. Unfortunately, I I don't have a way to answer it. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't do sort of systemic research. We're really focused on this one story. So we don't have an example of that in our story. Right. So y'all don't do systemic. uh, So this is not to expose the system for being corrupt and and faulty and um, pretty much defunct, uh, malfunctioned. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's, I'm trying to think of every word I can. No. <laughs> you know, well, you hear stories of uh, Carlos who comes in and he gets sentenced to 30 years. Like, what kind of drugs was he selling? <laughs> the sentence would he sell a boat? Super crack. <laughs> the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but that's not what you guys just telling a story. Right. It's a great well, story. Yeah, looking yeah. for the universal in the particular. So okay. telling one story and seeing what we can learn from it. You know, because as the caller, you know, he was sharing his experiences, but just from his one experience, you know, he learned so much about the system. So yeah. many things he was saying were things we've encountered by following Stephen and Brendan's stories. So there is something universal in everybody's story. I want to thank you guys for coming by. Absolutely. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank Moira. You. Moira. 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 <laughs> let, let me do it, Tracy. <laughs> thank you. They know it's not my voice. Moira. Perfect. <laughs> she just settled. Cool. She just settled. She didn't want to do the whole 30. She didn't want to spend 30 seconds on it. All right, uh, Laura, thank you for coming by. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Part two is, start, is out tomorrow on Netflix, um, Making a Murderer Part Two. Um, and then also, we want to thank our guest today, Dr. Ian Smith. 
Uh, check out his new book, The Ancient Nine. You got a chance of winning twenty five hundred dollars if you go to the Facebook, The Ancient Nine, and figure out the questions. The three questions. Okay, and then also we want to thank our guest for coming by. T Pain. T Pain. He got his new show, uh, T Pain School of Business, on Tuesdays, eleven p.m. on Fuse. And then also Nurse Noel for coming through this morning and, and speaking about. Um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month with Kelly Kincaid on first day um, with Kelly Kincaid. You can hear all of this stuff back if you want to go on our demand channel here at SiriusXDem.com. Slash on demand. Slash on demand. Also, we'll be posted on our website, SwaysUniverse.com, and uh, in the YouTube channel as well. Look for that tomorrow. Uh, DB, how can I reach you? Reach me everywhere at it's really DB. Also, don't forget you have until next Wednesday, October twenty fourth, is the deadline to submit your videos and your clips to Sway Comedy Show at Gmail dot com if you want a chance to be picked to perform at our Caroline's broadcast taking place Friday, November 9th. Hey, check out my photography page on Instagram if you have a chance. Uh, it's OQ Shoots. Tracy G. Twitter, Instagram for me, citizens, at it's Tracy G, I T S T R A C Y G. Also, listen up. One of my favorite gadgets that I've purchased is um, Amazon Echo. And now Sirius is partnering up to make sure that you can listen to us outside of your car. So when you upgrade to the all access package, you actually get the all new Amazon Echo Dot on the free. Whoa. Uh huh. So to get all the offer details, <laughs> SiriusXM.com slash upgrade now. And I'm so sorry, Canada, but the offer's not available to you. Oh, I like how you mumble rap that. All right, go ahead, Tracy G. I mean, uh, Heather B. I'm at the happy hour, WHB. I'm at Real Sway across the board. Um, until tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, we have nothing. Who's on the show tomorrow? We got Zaytoven. Zaytoven? Is he coming? Okay. Yeah, and uh, Kristen Gray. Okay, we have nothing left to say. What? Yeah.